go ahead and start recording and then I'm gonna make Sanjay the host. And uh, I also would just like to say a huge thanks to Sanjay for taking his time. Um, he's not getting paid anything for doing this. He's doing this entirely out of the goodness of his heart during an incredibly busy time and in the middle of changing jobs. So I just can't thank him enough for um, coming up with what I think has been a really fantastic uh, introduction to some of these concepts. So thanks, Sanjay. Um, thanks, Steve. And I think uh, the, the this has been a very enriching experience because uh, um, I, I think anybody who has started a class knows that uh, there is nothing more uh, intimidating and yet rewarding as there is to um, to 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 tell somebody else what you know and then be able to uh, motivate them to know more than what probably you know. Um, we are into academics for a reason, and uh, the primary reason is that it's a collaborative process. I think. Uh, no one knows everything and we know all very little bit of pieces, but what we know, um, I think we tend to try to be better than what we know. And I think that's what drives us. So um, I hope that some of the conversation that we have had uh, that would have motivated you to be um, use Python. Um, and it's not just the Python. I think R is equally uh, rich. And I think in one sense, I mean, the reason why we need, we use Jupyter environment uh, is itself a reminder. Um, I don't know if you, most of you know it, but the name itself comes from the first, uh, the three major languages that can be used for a data processing, Julia, which is coming along, uh, Python, which is uh, we are using, and R, uh, that is a, a very powerful language for a lot of statistics. And that's the, it's the merger of those three names. That is why this is called a Jupyter. So um, it, the idea had been to help you to uh, probably give you certain things that if you don't use it regularly, then probably you should be using it. And, um, and, and as you use it, you uh, begin to see the potential uh, and, and the value of that. And as to, so I think in that sense, um, I hope that uh, some of you will run into some problems, either running these notebooks or anything else that you will be encouraged to uh, do it. And then you will come back with some problems uh, back to me. And um, when you solve a problem, uh, generally that leads to a better solution for uh, you who raised the problem and I who have probably never seen it coming. So thank you for staying with me until uh, uh, the end of these five classes. Um, your staying is a testament enough that uh, I think something valuable has come out of this. So the last class was uh, designed to basically, in one sense, uh, wind up everything that we have done so far and uh, to be able to use the Python notebook system in itself as a central repository of most of what you do in your uh, scientific process. Unfortunately, that also means that the default Jupyter notebook system is not complete to handle that kind of uh, requirement. So um, what, what has to be done is that then you have to modify it to the needs. And what I mean is that you might have to install a whole swath of things that don't come pre-installed. I'll give you the very first example. And if you notice here, um, I think you can see that the way my uh, notebook looks is somewhat different how a standard notebook looks. And one of the most uh, elegant way to handle this is that you see that there is a table of content down here. And this table of content actually can be, uh, can be floating. So I can move it uh, and put it wherever I want, although ideally the best place to keep it here on the left side. And the way it becomes possible is that if you notice, and I hope that um, you can see it, um, can you see my, I don't know when I change the tabs, do you see the change of the tab? Do you see my environment here? Steve, can you help me here? Uh, what is visible to you? Because I really have no idea what gets seen. Hello? Yeah, uh, sorry, I had to find no, myself fine. to unmute. Yes, we yeah. see everything now, so that's good. So do you see here that the, this is not my cell, but you were seeing the Jupyter uh, environment, right? Yeah, the, the uh, 
the, the five, five tree, right? Yes, right. So you would notice that compared to most of you, and I don't know if you have ever activated this thing called NB extension, which is the notebook extensions. If you haven't, what normally the gets installed default is the files where you see the file tree, where you can navigate your environment. Uh, what is running? So if you have one or multiple notebooks, you will see them. And then of course, uh, most people don't use clusters. So I think given that most of us use one single computer, we will stay with that. So that's not, but this fourth tab is a rich repository of a lot of cool things that don't come pre-installed. So what you would have to do is that you will have to go to the notebook extensions and let's see if I have the window open here. It's one of my windows here. Yeah, here. So this is the repository and you will have to install this notebook extension or NB extensions for your own need. Uh, it's not complicated. It gets pretty straight away. There is a Kanda or PIP, whichever uh, package manager you prefer to use it. And once you install that, um, it becomes a central place for you to be then begin aggregating a whole lot of cool things. Um, so, so the table of, yes. We're not seeing your screen anymore. Is that, is oh, that should that on. be happening? Okay, yeah, no, I think uh, for some reason. It... Sorry, uh, I think I clicked out on that. So are you seeing here the uh, the notebook extension and there's a lot of these tick boxes? Yeah, we got it. So basically what happens is that once you have these uh, NB extension or notebook extension package from its uh, place here, um, uh, from here, once you go there, you will have to go there and let me uh, probably, I'll just send it on a chat. Um, so here is the, okay. There is the chat. So if you if you go there and uh, you get the notebook extensions installed on your notebook environment, then you will be able to see this extra tab once it has been activated. And of course, you will have to restart your uh, notebook, uh, the, 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 the server, so to speak. So you, which means that you'll have to close these instances, wait for some time and then go to your Anaconda. And then once you re restart it, you will see this fourth tab become effective. Now, not all of them will come pre-installed. So basically what happens is that at that point, you will begin to know which are the great end notebook extensions and there's no limit of them. There are a lot of them. It's a informal uh, repository of all kinds of cool things that people think should be done. And so then once you install it, uh, the NB extension tree will know it and then you can turn on and then turn off based on your requirement. So you, you basically just click them out and they will get activated or not. And oftentimes they also tell you a little bit of uh, things about it. So going back to, this is where the first school thing is. And so if you were writing a large, say a publication or a large notebook, this becomes very handy. Um, before I go, too deep into telling you how the table of content works. Let's briefly talk about the markdown. Um, you might have used it, uh, but there is a lot of, so the way this works is that if you open a new cell, and I cannot overemphasize you to get used to uh, opening, closing these cells, uh, activating them, changing their behavior, uh, by just the shortcut commands. Because if you are always going to these uh, top tabs, they get really slowed and you have to do a lot of work. So remember, it's very simple, um, uh, at least on the Windows system, and I know it's slightly different on Macs. If you hold escape and you do uh, A, it opens a cell, it creates a new cell above the existing cell. Um, escape B creates a cell below the existing cell. Um, you look at here that there is a top drop down here is the code. By default, the cell is created as a code cell. And this is where um, you, do, um, uh, you do your basic uh, functionality. So let's say if you're creating, um, and this is, uh, you're gonna create that. This is a standard behavior, which is what we have used so far. Uh, but you can change this to uh, a markdown. And if you want to be the, the like if you don't want to, uh, burden yourself too much by remembering the shortcuts. Uh, you can drop it down and here you get this as, uh, and now this is a markdown. And as you can see here, there's no code executed. 
what basically is this gives you an opportunity to write down a lot of things. Um, so the way you write it, uh, there are certain simple behaviors. Uh, you write the heading. So the first heading, first level heading is this. Uh, the, so the a hash is a header. Um, you can go downward and you do, uh, so let's say that we have here as a heading one, you do heading two, and you keep going at that level. And, uh, and this is how, so once we embed it, uh, you will see that this is a varying level of heading, heading header size and, and Markdown automatically chooses it. So depending on your, cons, depending on your context, uh, the sizes will be slow, smaller and smaller. If you have the notebook extension, the NB extensions installed and you have the table of content activated, you will notice that when I execute it, it will automatically get added on the left side with the header one, header two, header three, and these are clickable. So if I go to any one of these links, they are self-contained links. So if I click on this, it automatically takes me to where I want to be. So this becomes a very useful exercise if you have a large notebook. Uh, and while what is a length of a notebook entirely depends on your own personal choice, um, it is not unusual for a notebook to be, um, say, several pages long, except especially if you are writing a book or something and you want an entire chapter to be written within a notebook, I think it would be perfectly justified for you to have it uh, several pages long and navigation becomes difficult. And if you notice that with every subsequent header, it creates them into its own uh, setup. Now, if I would have, say, several things at that level, so let's say that I had 3.1, uh, 3.2, and uh, I had at that level, say, a 3.2, uh, three, you will notice that they will get clubbed together by itself within that setup. So it knows exactly where we want to be on 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, it clubs them together. So it's a very elegant way to, to uh, create your table of content without doing much thinking. And it's really intelligent and I really, really like it. Um, the other thing that a uh, markdown, so this is one of the things within the markdown, you can also have them italicize a link and other things. So uh, the way it works is that an underscore um, will italicize it. As you notice that it automatically got italics. So this is your italics, uh, it's an underscore. If you club it with say uh, uh, a, a bold, it will then be a bold italics. And similarly, you can just have it, uh, say you remove this, and now as you notice that this is now a bold header. Um, the notebook itself, these markdowns, uh, it is an HTML based uh, method. So a lot of the HTML based codings will work just fine. And I'll come back and I'll, I'll, I'll touch a little on that. Um, the other shortcut, so let's say that you are on a markdown. And so like I said, you do a uh, code and you are doing it. Let's say that I created a cell here and I do that and escape markdown and notice that the markdown changes. Now I am typing things here, uh, whatever I want to. Let's say that I want to go back to it as a code cell. Sorry, this got changed to, uh, so here. If I want to change it to a code, it's just the escape Y and for whatever reason, if you just go here, if you want to remember it, you can just change it from there and you can uh, then convert it back to uh, the code. So this becomes a useful exercise. You can also move them around. So let's say that you had a cell and you want to rearrange it. You notice that these arrows, these arrows would help you to basically move this cell. So this particular cell, if I just click down here, you notice that it goes below that cell. So you don't have to uh, type the whole thing all over again, uh, pay attention to these, uh, these two cells. Unfortunately, there is no uh, shortcut command for this. So, and I think that makes sense why that should be the case, because you don't want your um, notebook's behavior to change dramatically, because when you rerun the whole cell, uh, this has to be the, the, it has to be run in that order. And there is a lot of these things that are hidden within that. So if you pay attention here, um, I generally forget it, but one of them is has all the shortcuts uh, somewhere. 
somewhere there is a, it's, there is a, the table is written within that. Um, the other thing is that, uh, so let's go back to the markdown. And if you notice here, the markdown supports a lot of the details that you can write as you are preparing your information. So um, you can have an entire bibliography. Um, your references can be embedded. Um, right now, Zotero is the only thing that works here. So if you have the Zotero and you're running it on your system, uh, your bibliography can be imported in here and then you can embed them with a site to see uh, plugin which is in the uh, notebook extension. Unfortunately, I cannot show you because uh, certain things I have never actually used my laptop for a lot of things, but now that we are holed up here, um, I had to use it and I couldn't make it functional. But I uh, take my words for it, it actually works very well. If you have a Zotero, what you have to do is that you have to make sure that when you first time call for it, um, you have to link it with that, which is very straightforward. Uh, if the Zotero is installed on your system, once you ask for it, uh, once you call for it within this tab here, uh, and you have to install the site to see um, uh, extensions, once that is the very first time it asks for you the password and, uh, and things, and once you have it, um, okay, Salma is asking, um, what if you have another citation manager? I don't think that the EndNote works in here yet. Uh, or because uh, those ones are proprietary and there is no perfect way to import those citations. So I think the only option you have is that have the Zotero installed and then export your bibliography to that. And then I will have to look for it. Um, it is possible that there is a plugin, but I would doubt that that would be very uh, effectively uh, useful. Um, you can actually write them down as a citation too. So you can have a separate citation system. Um, you can just enter them and then once you compile it, the citation will be uh, put together. But I'll have to wait for that to test myself. The other thing is that, so you notice here that I can link these things and the way they link works is very straightforward. In the parenthesis, you give the URL and before the parenthesis, you tell what you want it to be visible. And once you have that, so here I'm telling that this is the line, this is my source. Uh, if you notice that I have italicized them by the underscores. Uh, and similarly, so once I, this is a markdown, once I run this, it becomes a very beautiful, uh, beautifully laid down document. And there's a lot more control. If you want to play with it, you can have your own XML, which will then make this functionality even more. You have a lot more control on your fonts. Um, you can even have the colors, uh, which are by default right now, here is a black and white, but if you preferred, uh, you could have a certain kind of a color scheme that you will have to uh, put an XML at the top of this cell here. So the very first thing will be, there would be an XML cell that you will define. And then once you compile the document, it will follow that kind of a color scheme. The other extension that I really, really like is, is this uh, called uh, CodeFold. And so if you notice here, this is how my standard codes would have looked like. And some of these codes can get very long and you know that they get distracting because as you're going through, you really can't see what's below because we are not interested in all these details. Um, if you have this NB extension called code folder, let me see if I can dig it out. Um, it's code folding NB extension. Here. This becomes very handy, especially when you have a really long uh, notebook that just runs on and on. Uh, so this becomes a very useful tool. Um, and then um, all you have to do is that you just click on this tab and then these things are hidden. Um, they are not useful when you are trying to go through a long notebook. And so by doing so, so basically what it does is that whenever this un encounters the first uh, comment section, it will uh, fold at that stage. Um, there are some more uh, elegant ways to handle the code folding. So if you have a function, if you have two layers of coding, um, it will actually fold them at two stages. So you can see the header, but then um, if you also have um, a, a second function definition, it will also be folding it there. So then you can see exactly what that, uh, what the code is looking like. The LaTeX. Um, those of you who have been used to typing most of the things on um, say uh, word files or something, they, you may not uh, have seen uh, the LaTeX as much, 
but it is the core language by which most of the things are written on Unix. And in fact, even today, uh, some of the word functionalities, uh, if you have complicated uh, mathematical uh, notations, they are translated back to the word through the LaTeX uh, structure. It's very straightforward. The way this works is that there is a certain uh, functionality. It is built in into uh, the notebook and it uses a mathematical math jacks. I think it's a Java library that it uses to render them. And there are two ways to handle that. So whenever you have anything that you write under these two uh, dollar strings, it interprets them as a call for a LaTeX uh, structure. Um, unfortunately, LaTeX is a very involved thing and I would, we would have a very little time to talk about that. But let me pull out a quick reference here. I think this is a reasonably quick reference. Uh, it's not complete in any way. Um, and, uh, but when you have time, uh, look into this. This can be a good way to start utilizing, but the way it is is very straightforward. So like in this case, it's a very simple uh, equation that I've written, C equal. Your special functions, they are defined by this uh, slash square root. So like in this case, it is a square root. The entire equation then gets clubbed up into uh, this curly bracket. And once that curly bracket, then it looks very similar to how other mathematical notation would work out. And if you had them within two squares, within two dollar strings, this would be placed at the center of the cell. If you want this to be embedded into a running sentence, then you don't need this double, or just a single will do it. So you have the single C, and then once you render it, as you would notice, it gets embedded as, um, as, this, uh, as these two. Because I also have equation counter as an NB, extent, uh, NB extension uh, included, whenever there would be a central equation, it will be numbered on its own. So then you can refer it back uh, through the uh, through the equation counter in your notebook. So this is another useful thing if you're writing a large number of body. Um, unfortunately, there is no way for you to have an equation uh, in the entire directory counted. So the equations are listed based upon the notebook and not based upon uh, your entire directory. So if you have multiple uh, intermediate multiple notebooks running in the same directory, the, the equations will still be numbered within uh, each notebook independently. So this would not be good for writing a dissertation, but this still is good enough for writing that one report. Um, and I'll come back to this, there are more into that, but the core functionality into the notebook for displaying all, some of these fancy things comes from uh, a library called display. And this is where I have this. So if you look at here, this thing I've called from ipython.display, um, I import whatever it is. You can import specific things or you can import the entire display, although it gets pretty pretty big. So I would, I would not necessarily go um, and willy-nilly import the entire display uh, with the hope that I don't know which one I want to import. So it is a good idea to import one by one. So, in case your basic LaTeX functionality here, and this is a pretty, co pretty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, extensive LaTeX support, but if that is not sufficient, you can also import the math uh, functionality. And then within the math functionality, then you can write a lot more complicated equation. Uh, and they follow the same uh, LaTeX structure. So what happens is instead of here, as I said here, that you're doing that stars, uh, you're doing the dollar string. In this case, this is now a part of the code cell and not a markdown cell. And that's the difference uh, between how you write the LaTeX. Uh, if you're writing a basic LaTeX, it will be uh, into your markdown cell. But if you want to embed that equation somewhere within the, um, within the code definition that you are writing a function and you want somebody to know uh, what that function was and what that function is trying to achieve with an equation into its description, then you will have to use this ipython.display uh, import math. The beauty is that this is now a, a coded value in the sense that you can call for that uh, whenever you want if you gave that equation a certain name. So let's say that here I call it equation one. And now if I Say, if I want to call in the next cell and I want to call what equation one is, it will be embedded on its own. So 
So we don't, once I have defined the equation, I don't need to uh, redefine define it just for the display purposes. And if you would notice, it's a pretty straightforward. All we are doing is that we're calling the math. You have to have this R because this R is what converts the information here into this fancy display. And then it's pretty straightforward. We are defining the function of K equal, remember the LaTeX, so we have to have this um, as int. This underscore here is the subscript, the this uh, the pigeon, um, uh, whatever it's called, um, that is the uh, superstring. So we have that. So this is under, this is a subscript, this is superscript, infinity signs, and then so on and so forth. And then once you render it, it gives you this equation. Anjay, yes. is there a way that you can suppress the display of the actual code cell so that you only see, like if you're trying to put it in a publication or something? Um, so the code cells, yes. So if you have the code folded, and uh, so basically the way it will happen is that if your codes are folded, like you notice that here I have uh, code folding, right? Um, the code folding works when you have, say like in this case, whenever you have this first, uh, this comment, at that point it would be code folded. So let's say that if I had this, and here I just said um, equation. So now I can just code fold it here and you notice that the equation is gone. So you will have to uh, somewhat elegantly try to think how you want to comment it. It would not completely go away. To best of my knowledge, this would still be there. And unfortunately, like I said, I cannot show you how the PDF works because uh, the PDF is process, uh, I think I was explaining you before, uh, is broken on my computer. I couldn't make that work. but. I hope that some of you will be luckier when you try to export it. So if you go here, you have to first have the uh, the LaTeX engine installed on your computer. So you first install a LaTeX uh, engine and that varies between the Macs and Windows. Um, and once you have that, if you go to file and you download it as a PDF, everything that is folded would remain folded and would not be displayed because what the LaTeX engine does is that takes this HTML dis display and converts that into a PDF. Um, Sometimes I have used this as it is, as a print function. So if you print it, remember whatever is embedded on your screen will then be printed as it is. So I could use this. This is not a very elegant approach, but it does work in certain conditions, especially if you're trying to create a short uh, summary or short report. So if at that point I can just save it as a PDF and then if you notice the, the code is not written. You cannot hide it completely because those cells would still remain visible if that's what you mean. Does that explain? Yes, thanks. Yeah, so uh, wherever uh, in the code folding, wherever the, it encounters the first comment, and actually not just the first comment, but you can actually have multiple comments and each comment is where it folds. And you notice here, this little thing, if you click on this, it will extend it back again. So basically that's the way, uh, this is the hiding. You can either utilize this or either you can utilize this. And depending on how many layers there are, uh, this will behave differently for that. So you can have these equations then displayed uh, using, so you can use this display library for a lot of beautiful things. And I'll give you some example, but these are not, uh, these are not uh, uh, completely exhaustive. And Angelo, yes, you are asking a very important question. Hold on to that thought. I will come to show you how you can display this notebook as a PowerPoint-like presentation. Um, it's actually very useful, uh, but it is still has a very limited functionality. So it doesn't work as beautifully as a standard PowerPoint, but it works well. And I'll come to that. Just hold on to it. So you can use this for a lot of things. And there are lots of built-in uh, uh, importers of uh, things in the display. So here is the other one that I'm, I'm showing you one. Uh, you can use it to display uh, your local images and you can uh, just use the, from IPython display, you import the image module. Uh, to that image module, you pass your file name and you can give it if you want to. If you don't, sometimes your image would be too big. So if you're not giving it a specific size, then the image might be native and can become too big. So I prefer to give it some size. Uh, you might have to play with the aspect ratio of your image. But once you have it, then you can display that image. And again, just like I said, because you are passing it as a class, 
it doesn't mean that you have to embed it right away. Uh, you can embed it in a different cell somewhere down the line. So now because the my image is an image class, wherever you embed it with that definition, the image will be lit, uh, rendered and displayed. You can also use the image module to get an image from an external source. So let's say that uh, we were, um, like there could be two ways. One that you want to have an image which is not yours and you don't want to necessarily download it. Uh, you can then pass on a URL to that, uh, to just the same way as you did before. And once you um, do that, it will be displayed exactly the same. There is a caveat. If you don't say that it is a URL, so like in this case, I am calling the Vandy logo, giving it an image class definition and I pass the URL without telling anything that this is a URL. It's exactly same as if I had my image stored locally. If that would be the case, then your notebook will capture that instance and will display it on your thing and will stay exactly as it is until this image is recall for unless you rerun the cell this image will remain standard but let's say you were trying to capture something which was like coming from a webcam or uh, or something like that and unfortunately i couldn't find a safe public webcam uh, where i could utilize it because you need to have it is in this format.jpg i'm sure there is a way that you can uh, render other kind of images but the point is if you say url equal at that point that image is um, is not completed, uh, it will basically keep changing within the cell dynamically. So if it was a web capture image and that image is changing at the source continuously, it will change even without you rendering the cell on and off. Let's see. Uh, okay. The other thing is sometimes you might have to a requirement to display a YouTube video. And fortunately, there is a built in YouTube video importer library. So I'll just go ahead and show you that this is the last class uh, that you that I just pulled off from YouTube. The one thing you have to notice is that when you are passing the YouTube video, you're not passing the entire URL, you're only passing this video definition, which is the unique video identifier, you're not passing the whole thing. So you go, uh, go to your uh, YouTube video, copy the link and pay, look for just that V equal and just copy that thing and you pass it on to the YouTube video. And then that, if you do that, it would be rendered here as a cell and then it is ready to play. So you can see that it does play just fine. Um, similarly, uh, this comes handy if you have a notebook which is uh, part of a bigger notebook set. You can actually ask for a file link to be embedded within your notebook. And so it's the same way you import this file link and file links. Uh, and the, in the file link, you pass on whatever your directory is. If you are passing a, Python, uh, a, a, a notebook which is within your uh, same directory, then you don't need to give it anything else. But if you were to look for something which is outside of your file tree, you will have to then locate where it is. And let's say here, and then you will have to be, uh, say if you did that, then your file link is down here as that. So um, you, can, you can have a file displayed if you were to refer it for some reason uh, going forward. Um, very similarly, you can also have the entire data tree, entire tree listed here. So if you just did a dot and you did that file links, you will notice that the entire tree is visible here. Although this gets depending on how much uh, junk you have, like I have in this directory, uh, it can get a lot uglier. So you probably want to define a certain directory and just display what is in that directory. And you can have subdirectories, so they are visible here. So uh, if you were to writing a report that these are the files that you use, uh, you can write a comment above here uh, as a markdown and you can just say that uh, these are the relevant relevant data files uh, used for this analysis. And then so um, here you, is your, Is yes. the action that is taken when you click on the link determined yes. by your system then? So like if your system says to display JPEGs with a viewer, it'll do that then? Yes. 
So if you mean, uh, did you mean down like here? Which section are we talking well, about? Well, just the one you were just doing, like where it created a link to a text file yes. or a JPEG file. So yeah. it would go to your system and find out. Yes, it will behave because I mean, the notebook, the notebook works just like a browser, right? So if anything can be displayed in the browser, it will be, this is just a link. So if I click here, as you notice, it just opened a separate instance here within my, uh, this, this browser and it's as if, so the beauty of this is that if there is a file that you were referring for some reason and uh, you uh, want it to be accessible directly from here and not remembering where it is, then you can just locate that file. Uh, it would not be executed. It will only be available for you to refer back. Uh, it doesn't run um, as the cell runs because all you're doing is, is providing a link to that. Does that? Yeah, so basically, it's, I guess it's not your system then, it's what your browser um, yes. settings yes. are to do with yes. that particular file type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's all it is doing is just working it as, uh, as a link as if it's a desktop, so to speak, I would say it, it works more like, because most desktops are um, just a browser to begin with anyway. So uh, it's just a place for you to link. If it is not gonna run with that, then it would not be executed uh, just like that. Um, coming to the HTML functionality, and again, uh, just like LaTeX, uh, the HTML is a pretty extensive thing. Uh, what I want to highlight is that everything, because this is an HTML rendition, whatever you can do in HTML would be rendered here. So if you have to write a small set of notation, if you had to color code, if you had to font change, or if you have to do something, you can basically do a very simple um, HTML structure. And I, generally it is not needed, but I prefer to write it that way. So if you're writing an HTML code, it reminds you that you are writing an HTML uh, code. So it's always a good idea to open and close with that. So here I'm just creating a very simple table, uh, creating a row and you have to know exactly what the HTML codes are, but uh, they become useful, especially if you're trying to uh, give some description. So let's say that you have certain parameters to pass and you want to write that these are the parameters we thought about it. These are the parameters we used. Um, so they become a useful uh, way to write it down. And within that table, you can also then go and link them to certain external or internal sources. So because the HTML, anything that you can do in HTML would be available for you to be done in the notebook. I was just so I going to read one comment before you go on from David Curie. He says, mm -hmm. see notebook convert, um, and there's a link to suppress input code in the final render display. There is a flag you can set to hide input and show only code output. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the NB convert is, I mean, the whole, the, the, uh, the NB extension is a very rich source of a lot of things that you can do to beyond. So the, the idea there is that it gives you a lot of functionalities that are individualistic, um, uh, play around, look it into what works for you. Um, and my, uh, here I'm trying to remind you that there is a lot to more to this process than just coding. I mean, coding is one part of it, but, uh, the, the idea that this uh, notebook system has become so effective is because it is a single unified uh, office environment like source where most things that you do, uh, you can do it. Although there are people who absolutely hate notebooks. So uh, that's a discussion for something else. Uh, but if you like it, then you can utilize it for uh, a lot of things uh, than anything. And the beauty is that if you're doing a process day to day, a data analysis, if you're doing uh, writing a report, if you're doing a lab report, or even if you're doing a publication, you don't have to go hunt for word files separately, sticking those figures, bringing them here. You can do most of those things within that. And if, you are, uh, if your system works well, then you can just go to your file and then download it at, uh, as, uh, as your uh, LaTeX or PDF or even Word actually, it will apply if everything goes well, uh, you can actually have a transporter here as a Word file and then you can just uh, send it as it is. So you don't have to look for where your files are. You don't have to look for your images are. Everything is accessible and there's nothing to lose. Um, so the question was asked about the PowerPoint. I will come to that. So you hear as this, if you see here the rise, uh, uh, I have this in, instance in, uh, installed, it's called Rise Slideshow. And again, let me look for if I can find where the uh, quick link is. Here is the Rise. 
you will have to inst install this. Again, it doesn't come pre-installed, but if you have it pre if you have installed, uh, once you have installed it, then your notebook then becomes, uh, all you have to do is you have to activate this and here it becomes your PowerPoint. And you have to, uh, you can individually choose what the cells are. So if you notice here now, it becomes more like a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and the way this would work is that once you have your, let me see. Uh, there's, once you have the Zoom running and everything else, it gets a little difficult. But if you notice in my case, there is, huh, there should have been a cell that would have been active here to tell me. That this is what kind of a slide this is what is going on. Okay, for some reason I cannot locate it, but each cell then can be defined whether you want it to be a slide or whether you want it to be a subcell or a, so basically once you have this uh, rise uh, slideshow uh, and I can pull off a different. Uh, is it under the word like markdown and code? Is it in there? No, it's I think because yesterday I was playing around with a whole bunch of these things to get my LaTeX to function and I think somehow something has not. Ideally, uh, in my case, when I would be when you have that installed, every time you start a cell, that should that should have told me down here as a cell drop down to tell me whether it is uh, is it a, which kind of a cell it is. But somehow I I didn't notice that that is broken. Uh, but go look for that uh, once you have it again. I it wouldn't necessarily be useful for me to show you the functionality of that. But if you have that, if you once you have installed the Rise Notebook, it will become a regular PowerPoint. The one caveat that is is that unfortunately. Uh, modern um, display systems, they are fo they follow a slightly different setup than say uh, our uh, notebook setup. So the PowerPoints, you'll have to play around with what gets displayed because they tend to get pretty big. Uh, so it is not a very polished way of presentation, but I think for the coding community, it is acceptable to use them however they look. They're not, like I said, they would not be a corporate wide presentation. But the benefit is that if you play around with how much your cell can contain and you break them into cells and sub cells, you get the effective uh, navigation tools. And I, unfortunately, it's not working right now for me. I just, I apologize. But you would have seen the little uh, navigator button down here. And once you click on it, you can go, uh, go to the sub cell, what gets visible. So if you have a large notebook and there's a lot of code chunks that you really don't want to talk about it, all you want to talk about is your description and your plots, you can choose to skip those code chunks. And when your PowerPoint is running, you wouldn't see them. Uh, they would be available on the notebook, but during your presentation, you wouldn't have to uh, deal with them. You wouldn't have to skip them or you wouldn't have to quickly roll them. And that's the that's the most elegant part is that you can present only with the graphs that have been generated. Now, the one thing you have to notice is that sometimes even those graphs, uh, you might have to play around with your display setting. What looks good on uh, rendered uh, screen is not what gets translated very well onto this rise show. Uh, but, uh, but there is a lot to play around there and uh, that, should be, uh, that should be something that you should look at into it. So when you're doing the presentation, then you could do, you can run the code live in the cell, right? So like yes. if you were doing a class and you had a presentation and you wanted to show this is what happens when you run a certain code, you could do it straight on the slide. Yes. Let me quickly. Can, is there a command that says run all of the cells up to this cell so that if you had a bunch of hidden code cells, it would do that? Um. I sort of yes. thinking there is a command. So here, so this is, uh, you, this can cell. you all see my, this, uh, this next, this presentation that is open right now? Yes. I wanted to talk about, so here is this rise show and I don't know why it is not working there. But if you notice here, I have the slide type. So I can choose whether it is slide, 
sub slide fragment or do I want to skip it? So let's go back to this presentation. So here I have this, uh, this was, um, I wanted this to be shown. I wanted this section to be shown. I wanted, so here, so you see that this is here, I've used this as a slide. This is a sub slide, but if I go down here, I will have certain things that would have been skipped like this code. I had worked around, but I don't want it to be visible. So now when I start the show here, you will notice that here, this is how, and uh, like I said, you have to play around with the presentation, how it looks, but can you see the presentation? Now here it looks like a PowerPoint, not a very good one, um, unfortunately, but if I click on here, it goes to this one. And then I can go down here and I can show the next section and you can work on this, right? As you go, uh, let's say if I wanted to highlight it, this would still work. So you can, you can, um, you can work on it because it's still, it's still is a regular notebook, except this is being displayed. And as you go down, the chunks that were not visible, they would not be visible. So you have to be, you have to be careful how you package your presentation because if there was something that you had to live code and you decided that cell to be a skip, then that cell would not be available for you to use. So that's, that's one caveat there is to package anything as a presentation. So I'll, Pause here, we have five more minutes. Um, I will let this to be uh, a last wrap up on if there are certain questions that you have. If you think that's something you wanna ask right now, um, I would guide you to certain directions. So feel free to unmute yourself and um, this is I the time for fun. Yes, yes. So I mostly use Conda and I'm wondering if for every single uh, project you have, you have a different Conda environment with a different Jupyter notebook installed in each, or if you just have kind of one Jupyter notebook installed on your computer and you use it for everything. Good question. Um, opinion varies. Some people like to utilize a thing like a Docker. The advantage of using a Docker kind of a setup, setup is that Let's say that you are worried that you did something today and a couple of years down the line, a certain library is changed and now your uh, notebook would not behave the way it is. If you want to time proof it and you want to isolate that kind of a trouble, having a Docker environment is a very good way to do it um, because then you are time proofing it that anything that gets happened down the line would not break your existing setup. The problem with that is that every time you allocate a Docker, you are providing a set of resources for that thing to run. So you would not be running a lot of different Dockers all at the same time. Uh, personally, I don't use it because I don't think that I have generally been worried about, I'm not using the libraries which tend to be changed that dramatically. So I run a single centralized Anaconda and I don't necessarily worry about creating a different uh, iterations of what I'm doing. Uh, that would be left to individual choices, uh, which one you prefer. So it, it, just to um, clarify that I'm understanding this. So like if you wanted to uh, time proof it, you could use a Docker image. If you were concerned that um, like, let's say you're using a library that requires some kind of obsolete a module or something, then you could, you could have a different environment within this. You could have like a different virtual environment so that your, your uh, configuration for one notebook didn't mess yes. with the other one, right? That's exactly what it is. Yes. So if you were, if you are uh, using a library and it, it happens to in scientific world pretty commonly that um, uh, you are normally you would be suggested to use the latest Python, which is 3.6, but let's say that you wanted to do something which is intermediate like 2.6 and you don't want it to be a default setup, but then your current pandas would not be compatible with, uh, with a, a 2.6 or something. So in that case, you need an older version. You will have to go to a Docker and Docker is very similar to virtual environment. Although there are some ethereal differences, how it works but that would be one way to handle that. You can future proof your libraries. There is a certain way how you can future proof it, but unfortunately none of that works. If you are really, really concerned about that your 
work requires a certain things which may or may not move all in the same direction, I think going to a Docker would be the safest way. So I was just going to comment before we run out of time that I will go, uh, when I save the recording, it also saves the chat. And mm -hmm. so I'll go through the chat and then on the landing page for the class, I'll put links to each of the um, uh, links that got put in the chat. So you don't need to worry about trying to save the chat. I'll, I'll create links. So just come back like later today to the, um, the landing page and there will, there will both be the video link as well as the links to all the things that got put in the chat. So I have a question before we go. Is there any, I mean, do people think that there is a value in putting this notebook? I don't know exactly uh, what, because it would, may or may not run all at the same time. So do you think that people want this to be uh, accessible? Do you, do you think that people need it? Okay, so I will, I will send a link to that and it will be available in the same um, directory. Thank you, everybody. This was really great. Um, um, please, uh, I'm sure uh, Steve would probably reach back to you for uh, suggestions if we ever have to do this iteration again. Um, I, I know that time, five hours is not sufficient uh, to handle a lot of these things. So maybe we'll have to think to make it longer. But until that time, stay safe and uh, have fun with Python. And thank you so much, Sanjay, again. Bye-bye.